All right, Matt Harmon, how are you doing, my friend? Doing well, Antoine. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. Really excited to be talking to you today. Thanks for taking the time out to uh, to chat with me. Um, so I'm really excited about uh, our conversation today. Um, uh, there's lots of topics I want to sort of cover, but let me first do sort of an introduction of you um, um, from my perspective, and then I'll let you sort of fill in some of the blanks. So you and I um, met back in like 2003-ish, I think, you and I were working for the same company in customer success. And uh, we've worked together a couple of other times after that too. Um, and uh, most recently, you've uh, moved on to an organization uh, that you've been with, looks like for about three years. And you've, you've, you've progressed in your career nicely since you and I first met. And you're currently the director, uh, head of customer success operations. Um, which is exciting. And you've got a team leading people um, still sort of in the customer success space. So part of what I want to, you know, sort of explore today is just understand, you know, your journey, you know, how you got to from where you were to where you are now, you know, was it calculated? Was it um, uh, accidental? And what are some of the pivotal sort of moments along the way and, and key learnings um, so that's basically it in a nutshell, but do you want to sort of fill in the blanks, anything I didn't mention, you know, that you think is important for anyone watching to know about you? Yeah, I think, you know, you know, just kind of some higher level stuff, you know, born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area and pretty much have been here my entire life. Uh, you know, went to school in San Mateo, went up to Davis for college, had some great times. And then pretty much after that, I've been working, um, it's, I look at it, I've been customer facing in a post sales role, whether it be sales, customer success, or in a leadership position for much of the last you know 20 plus years. So I think one of the things that I like most about as I sit back and look at my career and what I've done is I've been in different phases, different parts of the journey with the customer, different roles. And it really allows me sometimes just to step back and kind of take that 30,000 view view of the situation and put on my customer hat, put on my, you know, employee, my manager, the leadership hat, and really come to some great conclusions and to drive the team, so. Hey, I want to dig into that a little bit more later, yeah. um, uh, because I think that's an important piece, but let's start with um, a little bit more about your background, you know, um, and sort of the, the, the key values that um, you sort of live by. And I think it has a lot to do with our childhood and how we grew up and what that was like. So you mentioned you've been a California kid your whole life. I moved here from New York myself when I was a early teen. So just give me a sense of um, what your experience was like at home and, and you know, the type of qualities you had then as a kid and, and did those come naturally or was it helped? did your parents sort of help shape that? Yeah, so growing up, you know, I grew up, you know, middle-class family in San Mateo, and just, you know, had a, my dad definitely had a, a interesting career progression, and as I look at some of the stuff he did, from managing the, be a store manager at a Firestone, to being a, a biggest, working for one of the largest uh, wine and spirits distributor on the west coast and being the head salesperson there i really saw the hustle and the daily grind you know that work ethic that he would put in you know my mom was fortunate enough to be a stay-at-home mom you know raising me and my brother and sister but with that being said she also had a role where she was a typist for an insurance agency and effectively her routine was she got up helped get breakfast on took us to school, went to the office, picked, dropped off the previous day's work, picked up the next day's, you know, here's the, you know, X number of pages she had to transcribe or whatever. And she would just repeat that. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that scenario was it allowed her to always be home with us. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think she was, she did take a full-time in-office job, but it was well into my youngest brother being, you know, somewhere in middle school, Some, at a point where he could become self-sufficient mm -hmm. at home. So 
that hustle, that grind really is allowed, you know, seeing that, you know, it kind of gave me the work ethic and why it's just all I've always been. What do I need to do to keep going, keep progressing, never letting off the gas on things? Right. Now, um, so it sounds like both your parents played a role. And I think it's interesting. You said your father was in sales. So were you was that were you ever conscious about that as you grew up? Was that something you wanted to be like? Did that, you know, have I, influence on I, what you're doing now? You know, that has always been a part of my life. I just didn't realize it until mm. I was officially in sales. Uh, and kind of the story that I kind of think of was there's a picture of me as a young kid let's just say eight years old going to work with my dad you know and I'm you know he's dressed up in slacks and a dress shirt you know I got fancy dressed up you know and a you know little kid in a bow tie looks cute yeah I thought I was just going to work with my dad for the day I didn't you know after the fact I now realized that yes I was going and had a great experience with him just seeing what he did but that one memory also happened to hit at the end of the quarter and how can anyone turn down a, the uh, salesman who brings in his eight-year-old kid who needs to <laughs> sell a couple more cases of wine <laughs> and so yeah so it's kind of the things you realize you know when when I've been in a quota facing role it's like hmm can I bring my kid onto a, to a zoom call or something to help right. ensure that but it's kind of you know, with the whole sales thing and kind of talking, you know, when the, you know, you asked about personal values, one of the things I did in my young, you know, as a young adult was I was heavily involved with Boy Scouts and, you know, the Boy Scouts have their motto and the laws that, you know, which hold true, you know, the Scouts trustworthy, loyal, honest, you know, friendly, all these things are just key to a lot of the learnings for me as to who I became and how I live, <clears throat> tried to live by these rules to be the best person I could. And, you know, I started realizing like when it came to sales, scouting had as early as Cub Scouts in elementary school, Scoutorama, these tickets to this like annual fair that would be at the downtown park once a year. And I was routinely one of the highest purse people who sold the most tickets is because I would just go to the luckies with a safe way and stand outside the exit door and hustle. And yeah. I think that a lot of that just came from seeing my parents do it. And there you have me doing it at age nine, 10 years old. So your parents set a good example for you. And then uh, the being a boy scout and the values that they help instill um, sort of help reinforce what you were hearing at home already did you want to be a boy scout when you were a kid or were you hesitant i wanted to i felt like i wanted to do the cub scout thing because it was at you know all my other friends were doing it and it seemed like fun boy scouts became more of a choice for me than my you know than my parents saying hey you have to go do this i enjoyed a lot of the camaraderie that came out of it I enjoyed the learnings, the different kind of learnings, you know, the ability to go out into nature and explore things, a lot of the unknowns that come with just taking your backpack, plotting a trip. Uh, some of the stuff I learned there, I'm really finding out I'm dealing with on a regular basis now between, you know, planning of what's going on, thinking about, hey, we need to go, we're going to do this 100 mile hiking trip. It's going to be over seven days. What do we need to do to complete, to hit that 100 miles in these seven days? And how do we can prepare for contingencies and make sure that we have everything we need yeah. and can support it on our own, on our own backs without, you know, having a car there to, re you know, rely on to have backup. Right. Uh, so uh, did you... And now, the, uh, so you're a family man like me. I've got two boys. I think you have at least two kids. I got well, two right? boys. I got five and or almost six and eight year old. Okay. Did your did you understand your parents or at least your father better or differently after becoming a father yourself? I'm learning more about my father as <laughs> I get along, because as anyone who has kids, you know a 
two-year-olds and a nine-year-old are much different. And so right. there are more learnings I have every year as to how to interact with my children, how, what needs to happen and just making all that work. And then the always challenging part is the parents that I grew up with, they're not necessarily the same uh, grandparents my kids have and wondering what happened to the parent who was stern on things. And, you know, when they come by with gifts and stuff for the kids, it's like, we never got that. So just understanding those dynamics are interesting too. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, same for me. Um, definitely um, a learning experience uh, as a father, uh, <clears throat> understanding your kids and obviously, again, just putting your, your experience with your own father in, in more perspective, because uh, we know that plays a big role again in our lives. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk a bit, a little bit more about your, your education. You mentioned earlier um, going to school and then it looks like you ended up getting, you went to UC Davis, you got a bachelor's in political science. So what was it about political science in particular that attracted you to that? My take on college outside of your hardcore math and sciences that have a direct correlation to your profession. To me, college says you're educated above the normal reading and writing levels. You can stick with something and you can be trained in something. Yeah. I mean, there's not many art history majors who are, are curators at museums. All right. They're just people who really like, you know, art history. I personally liked political science. You know, I never had any aspirations for, you know, legal or politics, but I love the thought of learning about the past, hearing stories of leaders, how they took situations understanding law and governance and procedure kind of a little lawyer-esque but it's not a path I had an interest in going down right. to me political science really rang true because I felt it could be used a lot of different places and I wasn't pigeonholed into any one thing and also like a lot of college students it was what sounded good at the end of high school or under junior year of high school when you start doing all that application. Uh, I just happened to, unlike most people, to stick with what I went in there for. But for me, most of my learnings within college didn't come in the classroom. A lot of my learnings came from other things. So my path in college, my freshman year, I broke my leg and had to have surgery because I oh. broke it. So it was about the challenges of winter quarter, getting around campus on crutches, right. and navigating that those challenges. You know, and I my grades had a little dip, but I, it wasn't unsurmountable, and I recovered to obviously graduate. Yeah, there's the financial components. You know, it's not like we were had all the money in the world, so it was finding a job. Yeah. And for me, the job I had, I I found to me one of the best jobs on a campus for someone like me was. I worked in the dorms doing maintenance. Mm -hmm. It was great because I liked it because I wasn't behind a desk. Yeah. I was out doing things, fixing things. You know, I'm great at screening windows and unclogging toilets now because it's something I did for three years. <laughs> but it gave me real hands-on worldly skills that I use. Um, also, let's see. So my junior, senior year or my yeah, my junior, senior year, I was an RA in the dorm. So in order to help address the cost of living, I worked in the dorms and got free room and board to be a mentor and help be there for all the new freshmen that were there. And then the other thing that I'll never regret doing at Davis was my sophomore year, I did the Army ROTC program. Okay. And I did it. I, did, I started down that journey because it was an opportunity for a scholarship. You know, I got to do some cool stuff. I got to learn a lot about military history, got to do some military exercises. I remember one weekend, the kind of the big event was they landed two big Chinook helicopters on campus and flew us from Davis to somewhere down in the central coast Santa Barbara area for a weekend of training exercises. Mm -hmm. And that was just a really cool experience to fly in that kind of 
helicopter. And at the end of my sophomore year, I was given an opportunity for a scholarship. Um, I ended up declining it because effectively I had, would have had to choose between being an RA in the dorms, which is free room and board or a cash stipend. And the room and board was more amount and it didn't have any commitment owed back. Got it. You know, I don't regret the ROTC. It was a great experience. Gave me a huge additional insight as to the military. So how many years were you part of ROTC? Uh, just one year I was part of it. So okay, basically well, I made... oh, go ahead. But what does ROTC stand for? Reserve Officer Training Corp. So in order to be an officer in the military, you have to have gone to college. So often, you know, you have kids who go to the military academies, your West Point, your uh, Annapolis for the Navy, I believe. And but there's most colleges have an ROTC program where kids will go to that school, learn officer skills, take additional classes, get a stipend. Upon completion, they go to officer candidate school for finalized training. And then they typically serve, have a four-year commitment to the military Got for it. supporting their college. You know, the military um, has always fascinated me and how it's evolved its training and methodologies over the years. Uh, Jocko Willenick, for example, is a famous um, veteran who's written some books and he has a podcast and tons of YouTube videos. He's notorious for, I think, having three or four alarm clocks and he wakes up at 2.30 or 4.30 in the morning, I forget. Um, what are some of the key lessons that you learned from ROTC that you took away specifically from, from yeah. that experience? I think one of the key things that I've learned with uh, regards to leadership is you don't really ever see, the an analogy I like to use is you don't see firemen run into a building. They walk into a building. They walk because they need to be able to see everything that's going on, process it to make the right decision when they get into that building. So a lot of the things I learned leadership wise from the ROTC was just understanding what's going on when you come into a situation. Just because you see enemy fire coming from a certain direction doesn't mean, you know, you need to be aware of everything that's going on in the battlefield. So this way you can put your troops <clears throat> in the best position to deal with the challenge, but not put themselves into a dangerous position or expose themselves. So just really being able to take be forced into a stressful situation, look at what's going on and make the best moves. And that's kind of the, on that spring quarter activity is when they flew us down, we were put into a scenario where we were broken up into our squads and we had to go do missions where you had to go, you know, hit these checkpoints. And there was unknown things that happened in this checkpoints, random mm -hmm. uh, smoke grenades going off or bangs going off to, cause chaos, cause you to lose focus. But yeah. it was getting past that. It was having that become a normal experience. So this way, when it happens in real life, you're not, you don't freeze. Right. So would you say it's like uh, being calm under pressure, remaining composed, despite the sort of yeah, uncertainty I, of a situation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, to me, it, my life has been that of a duck you know on the top of the water the duck looks like it's in control under the water i may have my feet going a mile a minute <laughs> but i need to always have the presence that what's going on is what's under control now I you don't see. need to know inside my mind that i got a bunch of things going on and i'm trying to process you know every possible permutation of what could happen yeah and to find the best solution you just need to know that I'm going towards, you know, I'm going towards these uh, breadcrumbs. Got it. Got it. Okay. So last thing on, on education before we transition into sort of leadership and, and customer success. Um, you know, learning is a never ending journey. Um, once you got out of school, 
were there any training programs that you participated in? Did you, um, you know, read any books? Any, any uh, things that sort of stand out that sort of helped shape you? So, I mean, there's not, I would love to have done more training programs. Uh, definitely not something I've had done as much of. Um, and I've read a few books. The one book that really kind of jumps out at me is for lessons learned and leadership and just business in general is this book I read by uh, Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. And effectively, he was one of the top FBI negotiator. And then he took those same skills into the business world. And this book really taught me, you know, he would take an example of a hostage situation, translate it into a business situation, negotiating for on a contract or whatever, and then how those principles cross over each other. And just for me, it was a really engaging book and one that I think I've read about two or three times and I'm not a person who reads many books. So okay. yeah, sometimes you just find that book, that author that really encapsulates you and gets you uh, going, so. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting one. I haven't uh, uh, read it, uh, although, you know, splitting the difference I know from negotiation training is a, a common sort of mistake that people make when uh, faced with that sort of situation where let's say simplistically you're trying to sell something for $20, person offers 10, the easy next response is, well, let's split the difference and agree on 15. When in fact, you know, you may have gotten 18 or 19 had you tried, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And that was like one of the uh, one of the stories on there was, you know, he went to the Harvard, uh, Harvard symposium on negotiation. Yeah. And everyone was laughing at him like, OK, what's this guy going to be able to do? Uh -huh. He's just a hostage negotiator. He doesn't he's uh -huh. not a business guy. He doesn't know what's going on. And he ended up having the best scores ever because, <laughs> you know, he didn't just split the difference. You know, That's and, right. Yeah. And the whole psychology, you know, one of the things in his book, you know, from a pure sales point of view is, was not dealing in whole numbers. Yeah. If I give you a contract for, you know, 2,500, you're going to, you know, try and whittle me down. But if I say, you know, 26, 38, 52, you're going to, the psychology of it becomes, well, he's, if he's giving me such a specific number, there must be something calculated. That must be what actually should, what it should be. I see. Oh, that's an interesting technique. I haven't heard that one before, but it does make sense. So you mentioned psychology. Um, I'm a big believer in um, the sort of learning about human behavior, what drives us to say and do the things that we do. You, you know, any thoughts on that outside of, you know, the, the, the example you just referenced? So one of the things for me, as I look back at, you know, the last 20, 30 years of my life and what I have done, I realize I'm selling an experience to people. And, you know, on a per personal side, you know, much, much of my life before wife and kids, I was focused on scuba diving in Monterey. I worked at a dive shop, you know, trying to convince people that putting on 50 pounds of gear, a thick wetsuit to go jump into Monterey, which is 52 degrees, and you can maybe see 20 feet. It's a lot of, it's a lot, it's challenging to get people to do that. Right. And to be able to work with them to understand why you want to do this mm -hmm. and kind of drive them to say, so here's, so yes, it is painful to do all this, but here's where we're going to get to. When you're, you know, talking to stories about being down teaching a class and having a sea lion or harbor seal use my legs as a bed or having a, you know, I've had a sitter area where I had a sea lion right in front of my face. He did a barrel roll. I did a barrel roll. You know, we did this for about five minutes. So he got bored, you know, <laughs> and then explaining about these little tiny things called nudibranchs, which are sea slugs, but colorful and an inch big. You know, and just the things that you can do, 
you know, just trying to get them past the psychological block of it's cold, it's a lot of gear, and it's no fun to drive them past that to understand the experience that I'm trying to sell them. Right. That what I'm trying to get them that I know they'll like. You know, much of the ways, why do you try and, you know, with kids today, you know, trying to get them to try new things, you know, hey, here, try ice skating, see if you like it, you know, because you never know, you could try, like it and go into hockey or do whatever else. But if you never strap on skates and at least try, yeah. you won't ever know if you like it. Yeah. Now I know that you're a dive master. It's one of the things I wanted to talk about later, but I guess since you brought it up, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit because I find it fascinating. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to want to pursue scuba diving and exploring sort of uh, the ocean and, but it's another thing entirely to be a dive master. So can you talk about what that means and uh, what the process is like? I, I spoke to someone uh, in a different video who was a sommelier Mm. And I know that that's quite challenging uh, and prestigious uh, sort of title to achieve. And I kind of feel the same way when it comes to dive master, isn't it? Yeah. So dive master is a professional level certification for the dive industry. And it means that I have a certain number. I think the minimum threshold is a hundred dive, hundred log dives. I have a variety of types of dives, but I've also gone through a, a pretty rigorous training program, which a lot of book learning and the, on subjects dealing with physics, you know, dealing with everything with buoyancy and why diving rules exist. But also there's a lot of how to be a leader, how to be a teacher, how to teach classes. Because mm. it's, I'm not saying it's easy to teach a class in a classroom above water, but imagine trying to go over skills with people when you're 30 feet underwater, you can't talk, it's only hand signals. And by the way, if somebody magically lets go of their weight belt too quickly, they're gonna go flying up, which could kill them. Right. So there's a lot of things about understanding how to control a room or a pool or an ocean. Deal Once again, you're getting into the dealing with the unknowns. You know, I've been, you know, at one point I was working on a dive boat uh, and as a dive master, helping people go on dives. And I was with these two people and would go down, they're certified, which meant they should have known what they're doing. But unfortunately, they got to 70 feet. One started panicking and his weight belt almost came off. So I had, I'm at 70 feet. I'm holding on to him and holding on to his weight belt. And I need to find a way to get us up to the surface slowly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because if I let go of him, he's going to go right. cleaning up and be in a very bad shape. Right. So it's just a lot of the dive master training is how to deal with things that can hurt people. Right. But Patty, so I'm certified through Patty. And one of the great things that I learned from them is how to teach a course. And so as I'm in the leadership position, I do a lot of this. And when I have trainings for my team or go over things, it's here's what I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you it. And then here's what I taught you. It's kind of when I do a lot of my trainings is, and I got that from all the Patty, the certification materials. It's here's the lesson plan. We're going to go over how to clear your mask. I'm going to show, show you go through the process of clearing your mask. As a recap, this is how you clear your mask. And just that kind of three-part <clears throat> process for delivery has been a great learning out of that dive master program for me. Yeah, it's definitely uh, something special and um, uh, something to be proud of, certainly. So perfect segue, because you mentioned leadership. So you're in a leadership role now. You know, like most people, we start out as individual contributors. When did you know you wanted to be a leader and, and when did it sort of happen for you? What steps did you take to sort of make it happen? Yeah. So one of this, when I, I knew I wanted to be a leader, you know, probably about 10 years ago, it probably started and it was, or, and I knew I wanted to be a leader because I knew I had more to give than just the, you know, going through doing this X project a month. You know, it was, you know, upsells or renewals, you know, 
I get my list of renewals and I find them, I go through it, and I process it, great. I wanted to do more than just be a cog in the machine. And for me, it all started with, with you know, in order to be a good leader, I feel you need to have a few things. You need to have an idea, a, a plan, and a mentor. And so for me, it was, I took, I realized as much as I love customers, I also love data. And, you know, in customer success, everything is always about your customer health score and how healthy are your customers. And I would then, I would take my list of customers and start playing and having some fun in Excel, doing conditional formatting, doing VLOOKUPs to raw data to see how much, you know, of the product they're using and seeing a trend line, you know, and just seeing how that changed over the last six months and do that for my patch of customers to identify upsell opportunity before it bluntly presented itself to me. And so I started doing that for myself. And next thing I know, I had other CSMs looking for me to help them do the same thing for them. And that parlayed into building out a team of, hey, let's just focus on this. Yeah. Start focusing on that ops thing. And I've had an opportunity at a lot of hops over the last few years to come up with the thought and just start building on it and take those wins, those successes and keep building more and more. And I built a team purely focused on customer retention where I just looked at all my sales skills and said, well, these customers canceled. Why don't I go and just try and win them back? Cause I'd rather get 50% of, you know, what they used to have than 0% of it. Right. And then in what ends up happening is, yeah, the customers come back, we get longer term deals because they feel valued. Um, and one of the things I, that tickles me today is that one of the early members from that team, with that customer retention team, she's now the manager of that team and they're doing more. And so one of the things that's driving me now is I get more senior as a leader is seeing leaders I've helped to identify and seeing them grow and seeing <laughs> that they are going up. And I'll be stoked in five years when she has leaders yeah. that she grew it's almost like that uh you know the belichick coaching tree you know how many coaches have <sighs> have come out of some head coaches it's really interesting you say that um are you familiar with john maxwell the author of five levels of leadership yeah so he's uh written quite a few books and uh in five levels of leadership basically what he um talks about and I, I learned and benefited from is in fact what you just said. There's no higher calling for a leader than to create other leaders. Um, so did you know that ahead of time or again or was it sort of organic? For me, it was a, a lot of that was organic. That whole nurturing and just driving to be better, you know, and kind of as I look at the teams I'm building today, you know, within the customer success world, I'm at a large company and I've created, I was the first CS hire there. And what was me and my boss three years ago, now it's 50 people when I have 10 or 12 underneath me under multiple disciplines and we're constantly building out teams. I'm looking for people who are better than me. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an intern who works for me. She's a second year master's student and she's very smart and knows a heck of a lot more than me, more modern stuff. She's a data scientist. I'll show her some of the stuff that I'm trying to do. It's like, I know where I need to get to. I know the raw data, but I'll do it in some archaic Excel fashion. I say, here's what, here's how I attack the problem. I know it's not the fastest way. Yeah. If you find, you know, here's what I'm trying to get to. Can you find a bigger, better, faster way? And I turn her loose and she, She's not, she's an intern only on, you know, on work day yeah. in the, the HR system. Outside of that, she's a full member of my team and I put her into a position to shine. Yeah. I don't want to present to my boss or my boss's boss. I want her to be there because it's her work. She's getting the credit for it. Wow. You know, that's really, really admirable. So you, you possess some really advanced 
sort of leadership skills as far as I'm concerned, because one, you have this desire and you gain the satisfaction of creating other leaders, but also you're humble enough to admit you don't know it all and you wanna hire people that know more than you do in their respective areas. And again, that is not common. That is not the quality you see in most managers. So the fact that you possess that is, is really commendable. So again, th th did you sort of stumble upon these things? Did you know it all along or maybe did you learn the lessons along the way? I think I've been, <clears throat> I've been fortunate enough to have some good leaders, you know, such as yourself, who I've worked with, and it's just, you know, seeing how they interact. And also, I've had some bad leaders I've been underneath who I don't want to be like, you know, yeah. and it's kind of you take the good and bad of everyone, and you kind of become who you want to be. Yeah. I know I'm not the best at it all, and I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to be put into a position where you know, I say I did all this machine learning and then somebody who's really an expert comes and asks me a question that I should know. And it's like, no, that's, I'm trying to be authentic. I'm trying yeah. to be who I am. And much like, you know, conductor at an orchestra, yeah, he may know how to play almost all the instruments, but he's not going to be the best. But yeah. if he's doing his job, he can make everyone be yeah. a top performer and everyone goes up ah so that's another great quality again I'm, I'm really impressed um matt because you're talking about creating a culture and environment where others thrive and can perform at their best and that's a lesson i learned from a book called multipliers uh, i think it was the author's liz weissman um i'll put links in the description of the video to all these books for you know Forgive me if I got it wrong. Anybody out there listening, I'll, I'll correct it. <laughs> and the, uh, but, but another great quality, I think, of effective leaders are, is, again, creating a culture environment where others can thrive as opposed to the opposite. And for what it's worth, I mean, I, I appreciate that I was able to um, be a positive influence for you. You know, personally, I think I was awful at leadership when I started <laughs> and I made a lot of mistakes and um, I'll, I still make plenty of mistakes, but I've kind of settled on the fact that, um, you know, I've committed myself to learning from those mistakes and getting better. And that the reality is none of us will ever be perfect, yeah. but if we can take ownership and commit ourselves to getting better, that's all you can ask for. Right. Um, and you mentioned authenticity, which is something I also um, value myself and I think helps create um, more effective leaders. Um, and, and that's risky, though, isn't it, though? Because if you show, you know, some vulnerability or if you show some some emotions, you could be perceived potentially by some as being weak. And while I think there is a risk of that, I think by and large, the vast majority of people, good people, will appreciate your authenticity and, and your humility and, and will rally around you um, as a leader. Would you agree? I, I definitely agree. I think it's... Being vulnerable, I think, is a necessity as a leader. You know, you need to be open and let others know that what I'm saying is true and that I'm there to be helpful and to drive them. And yes, it does open me up for vulnerability because if somebody, if there's a workforce reduction or something, they say, okay, well, well, what does, you know, let's go to office space. You know, so what do you say you do here on any given day? You know, if I may not be the one doing the machine learning, managing our platforms or doing something else, but I'm the one who has all the knowledge that helps push all that, keeps all that in sync and all that running together. You know, I don't have all the machine learning AI knowledge that my intern does, but I know the data better than anyone on the team because I've been in it the longest. So I think that being vulnerable and allows me to put my team into the best spot. And yes, I want them to go up. I mean, it's I'm happy and I'm sad at the same time. I got one of the team members who I hired in March who is phenomenal for my role, but there's a better role on our team for him. And mm -hmm. I'm losing him in the near future to go to that opportunity. And he's still within the team, so it's not like it's a loss. You know, it's a loss for me and my role, and I have to right. get a replacement. 
but it's a better fit for him and everyone will benefit as a result. Of that. That's right. Another great quality, Matt. Um, yeah. Bad managers will hold people back for fear of losing them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact that you're willing and able to help someone get to where they want to go from a career perspective, even if it means having a backfill for them, is truly the, the right thing to do. And I think that, again, it's an excellent, it's another great uh, example of why you've been an effective leader and you've accomplished so much in your career. So um, really commendable, uh, Matt, you know. Uh, so there, it's no surprise to me, I guess, that you've been successful because you seem to be you know, um, doing all the right things, you've taken all the right steps and you've got all the right sort of qualities. So what's next for you, Matt? Like, what do you want to do ultimately um, long-term? Where do you see yourself going? Yeah, so that's that's always the billion dollar question. I think, so one of the things that I've been able to, that we've done at, so at where I'm at in the last year is really talked about progr career progression and where you're looking to go. Mm -hmm. I want to get to a point where, you know, I'm a chief customer officer. My goal is to be interacting with the customers to understand what they're trying to get to, working with a variety of teams to ensure that match happens. To me, being in the CS world for the last, you know, 10 years really has been great and is leading me on that path to really be that chief customer officer and drive behavior for your customers to make them successful with, I don't care what the product is, whether it's, you know, a bread maker managing loaves of bread to, you know, fortune 100 company and, you know, hundred thousand customers, you know, your customers are important, but yeah. having your team be there is uh, also. Yeah. That's an ambitious goal. And I have no doubt that you'll be able to get there if that's truly what you want to do, Matt. Um, listen, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, thank you so much again for taking the time to chat with me and sharing your journey with me and, and ultimately with the rest of the world. Any last words you want to share, you know, any bits of advice or anything you think is super important for people to know? No, I, Antoine, it's been great chatting with you on this and uh, kind of talking about everything, you know, my history, I think, my suggestion for any young or proven or existing leaders, just, you know, find a person or a group of people that you can talk to, that you can be honest with, you know, maybe they've had more experience, different experiences than you, but just having that network of people that you can bounce ideas off of, you know, say, hey, sometimes it's a job opportunity that sounds good, but sometimes you should bounce off those people and say, hey, I got this opportunity and really make sure it's the right thing for you. Um, learn, learn from what you're doing. You know, mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've had mistakes, whether it be decisions I've made on the team, hiring, whatever the case may be, some good, some bad. And it's just learn, be, open, right. to, be open to acknowledging mistakes. And it's fine to make mistakes. It happens. Just try not to make it a second time. That's right. <laughs> I love it, Matt. Great stuff. All right, my friend. Thanks yeah. again. Uh, let's keep in touch and uh, uh, really excited to see where you go next. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thanks, Antoine. Thanks, Matt.